three quick items. Before we get started. Um, Saturday, I think it's Saturday, 1022. Uh, we're having an open house to the public. Um, here's what I'll do. If you come to this, and if you invite someone to come, then if you will, if you will show me the person that you brought, then I will give you a ticket that will put you into a drawing or something. Okay. I'm looking at calipers and stuff right now. So, but it'll be something substantial. Okay. So, uh, anyways, this is on 10.2. <clears throat> Um, I don't really see a time on there. I'll figure out a time or find a time. It's got a little QR code on it. <clears throat> also, um, like I said, snap on catalogs here. You can take a look at it. And then back to school bash happens today, 10 to 1, free lunch. If you will visit three booths, okay, so there'll be like all these booths set up on the quad, that section in the middle. Um, if you will visit three booths, and bring me back something unique from each one. So, like, don't send out a party of three to go grab a handful of three things from them all, and everybody comes back with a squeeze ball, a bookmark, and a pen. And I, I don't want 12 of those. That's not what I'm looking for. I don't want the items anyway, but I want, I, want, I, want, I want to make sure that you go out and communicate with some of these groups out there. So. Um, it could be a sports team, it could be um, a club, it could be a navigator, I don't care who it is. Show me three things when you get back, and then I'll give you a ticket, put it into the drawing, and then we'll do it for something else. Okay? So easy, easy money on these things. Okay? So I'll talk to the rest of the group about that whenever we get going. So, um, all right, so if you have been keeping track of Canvas, um, and if you get alerts, then you probably saw me active. I usually get active in Canvas, if not during the day, around 9 o'clock at night. So uh, last night I was in there, put the 29th edition machinery handbook in there, just as an update. That way if you're at home working on something, and I've got a question in there that says, according to the 29th edition handbook, um, what is the minor diameter for, you know, half 13? So you can you can't you can't go. I don't know, man. I don't have my handbook with me. I googled it. Here's what the answer is. From this is where I want the answer to come from. Okay. So you got to look in there. Googling it will give you rough ideas, not always the right thing. Okay. Um, you should have already completed your general knowledge safety test. Anybody not complete that? Okay. Probably need to get in there and get it done. Okay. If you haven't got it. You need to do it in all of them. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, each one's going to score it. So is there, no immersive or is that one? there is no immersive anymore. So everything's in Canvas. Yeah. Yeah. So immersive is dead to us now. Um, you'll find that these are equally as annoying. So it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. They're all equally annoying. All right. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple of modules. Uh, today we'll talk about we're going to be in section six. This will be in your book. So section six, units one, two, and three. Um, we'll look at the PMI block. Module three next week. Uh, we're going to we're going to bring everybody in here on Monday. We're going to go through lockout tagout. And if you'll notice, um, they wired up the horizontal yesterday, and I went ahead and locked it out. Um, they've got the box disconnected. Um, I went ahead and locked it out anyways, just so. You know, just to be sure, make sure nobody does anything. Nice. Yeah, that's all the time at work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they've got like the one with a bunch of little holes and stuff, so everyone you know it's up there locked on top. That's what's on there. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what's on there. Um, we've got them for anything from extension cords to um, the the ring hasp like that, and then mm -hmm. kind of everything in between. So, and there is a specific. Lockout tagout lock. It's not just any kind of lock. So um, lots of times people will just put a padlock on there. There is a specific lock that you're supposed to use for stuff like that. So according to the book or in the book, we'll be covering at least for now sections uh, six and seven. That is milling and grinding. 
which is the, the, basically the name of the class that's ran. This is a new project that I added in last night, angle block set. Other than that, um, you've got NIMS milling. That'll be our uh, part, the NIMS part that we make. Our indicator arm, a couple of you guys are already working on that. Sign by jaw, at least one of you guys is working on that. Your NIMS is going to be 200 points. Projects are 500 points. NIMS is 200 points, or certification is 200 points. And then uh, assignments, other work, things like that will equal approximately 300 points. Okay. So the new one that I put in last night is the angle block set. And I've included the four blocks that I want you to make. I, I included, and I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an option here, um, heat treating guidelines for 01, and then heat treating step-by-step, -step, which you've seen before. Um, and then on these, let's just pull up this one. Let's see how quick it goes. Let me go ahead and download it. Uh, nope, that's pretty fast. So here are the blocks that you'll make. This is just the 45. Most of them are double angles, so they're like 10 and 40. Yeah, you flip, yeah, they're upside down. 45 is one that won't work like that because it takes up so much of the block. So you'll use either O1 or A2. So I've got both materials in size that are approximately, oh, I don't know. These are half inch wide. I think the material is 5 eighths. Um, and then um, it's 5 eighths by inch and a half. You're going to saw them a little bit longer, 4 inches on these. Every dimension really needs to be uh, ground after heat treat. Okay, so if you'll notice, the part should be hardened and ground to Rockwell 552. All dimensions apply to the finished part. Okay, so um, I'm calling for perpendicularity and three place decimals is plus or minus one. On A2, you're less likely to have movement. It's going to be an air quench versus an oil quench. It's going to look, it's going to look and be easier. And I might even do a separate video. I'll give you some guidelines on heat treating A2 that I'll add to this. Um, and then we'll do a quick video on heat treating A2 as well. Same processes, just different, just slightly different recipe though. So same thing, you're gonna heat, you're gonna do a preheat temperature, then you're gonna bring it up to uh, the temperature for heat treat. Then when you take it out of the oven, rather than put it in the oil, since it's air cooled, you're going to just try to do a rapid cool on it. So in the air. And so what, what we usually do um, is a lot of very common, take a box fan, blow air on it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can do something like that too. Yeah, what we had was a big cart that had a box fan on it that just blew up on top of the parts. And, um, a lot of times people will just lay it out in an open area. I mean, we can do that. I like to try to rapid cool this thing as, as quickly as possible without throwing it into a freezer. You know, um, that's not beneficial for it. But yeah, we want to make sure this thing cools down. So there's going to be four different blocks that you're going to do. Uh, they're different in, in shape. All of the outside shapes of them are exactly the same. So that means what you should do is make five, right? So if you need four, make five. Make all the outside shapes, then put these things in them. You make five in case you scrap one. And then you work on the ones that could possibly be other ones, right? So like I had the guys, the 101s are on their uh, tack guide. And so yesterday I told them, what do you start with, the biggest hole or the smallest hole? And they're like, biggest hole. I'm like, smallest hole. Because if you scrap your smallest hole, you can make it your biggest hole. But you can't make your biggest hole your smallest hole. So you can always flip the part around and do it the other way. So you need to anticipate. I know none of you guys would ever make a mistake. I never did. One time somebody thought I did. That was their mistake. Uh, but you want to be prepared in case there is a problem along the way. You ream the hole 350 and you're like, ha 450. Dang it. Well, you can always go bigger, but you can't go smaller. So you want to make sure you're doing that. All right, so go ahead and close this one. I'll show you one other block. Just so you can see, here is a 3510 block. And then you can just go ahead and print these out. I would highly recommend that you would print them out. Okay, so here's, here's the 3510. 
and it's called the 3510 because it's 35 degrees on one side, 10 on the other side. And so um, they all have the same style of pocket for the engraving on them um, or the stamping. Should be about a 50,000 steep slot. You'll stamp it in there 35 to 10. You've got two different angles. Really, the only thing that should not be ground after heat treats is this pocket, this pocket, these two holes. Now, here is the biggest hiccup. There's one surface grinder. Okay, you cannot surface grind anywhere else. One surface grinder for six people. That means five of you guys plus a 104. That 104, when he gets to the grinder, I know the way he works. He will save all of his grinding for the very end. And at week seven, try to consume the grinder. Because that's how his mind works. Right? His mind works very like, I'm going to do all the milling. I'm going to do all the turning. I'm going to do all the grinding. That's not how your mind needs to work. Your mind needs to work like, um, I've got 30 minutes. This is a 25-minute part. I'm going to go ahead and knock this out. I've got this time. I'm going to shuffle all these parts together. When I get to these points or time, I'm going to do the things I need to do. So I want you to start knocking out of your mind the idea of projects one, two, three, four, five. Sometimes you do project five, one, three, two, yeah, four. Right now, like their own indicators. Exactly. Right. You guys so are doing. You guys are doing a great job of uh, shifting around in different places. That's totally fine to do that. You don't have to do anything in a specific order. No big deal. Um, your part gets ground, um, faces and top and bottom. Um, yours is no grinding, yours is no grinding, what are you working on, indicator arm, no grinding. So currently the parts that you're working on have no grinding on them. I've never ground yet. Yep, so we've got the one Tormach, we're looking at a couple of other grinders, um, but really it's hard to find the kind of grinder that we want. And so um, I would, I would be open to some hard milling, but um, you got to you got you to gotta remember, even in hard milling, there's going to be remilling it as it's hard. So heat treating it and then milling it. Um, but remember, you're, you got you to gotta take some extra steps in doing that. Um, so, like, I might find myself doing this. I might find myself service grinding all of the outsides of them because that's easy. I can do that all at the same time. I can lay them down, grind all of all four of them, flip them over, grind all four of them, clamp them together in a vise, grind all four of them, flip them over, grind all four of them, set them on their edge, grind all four of them, set them on the other edge, grind all four of them. Now the angles are all, all individuals, and those will be time constraints on that, right? So that's where all your time goes to. So you might want to go, let me get you a, a good carbide in mill, and you might mill those in. Okay, so you might mill the angles. If I were going to do something, that's probably what I'd do. Because I can do all the other things automatically. And the best way to do that is when you're going to set these four of them up that are all the same, you get that grinder going, and then you go over to the mill. And let the grinder grind while you're milling. When it's done grinding, you come over there, you flip your parts over, you get a good side grinding, you go back to the mill, or the lake, or the bandsaw, or whatever. That way you're not standing there. The thing that I hate the most to see, and every every shop boss in the world will hate to see, is the grinder going and you standing there not doing anything. The grinder moves automatically. It shouldn't be moving automatically. So what happened in the other shop all the time is people would pull up a chair, nest themselves in with 14 bangs and a sonic bag, and sit there on the internet, and and here's what they do: it would rah, 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 and then get to the end, and it would just air grind until they got done where they were at. And what did they end up doing? Running the browning sharp grinder into the back panel and busting the seal on the um, ball screw or the lead screw on it. That's how the brown sharp got destroyed. Shea wasn't paying attention. 
ran into the back of it, and ruined it. So, I mean, we had, a, that was a pretty slick grinder. It was old school, but it worked really well. Anyone pay attention? He was on the internet. So and it's a maxi with this grown R grinder. Really yeah, bad. it's easy to do. There's a chunk missing out of the grinding wheel. Like, that bitter That's grinder. repairable, though. And it shot out, and like, you know, like the big metal cover? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is on Blanchard? Oh, through that. On Blanchard? No, no, no there's sure one. Yeah, it's it's like that Tormach one, but like but bigger. three, four times yeah. bigger. Yeah, that's a that's a big hit to to do that, right? Yeah, like you put a whole street through that thing. Yeah, like, there's a yeah yeah grinders can be super dangerous. So um, we got a whole section that will cover over grinders today. We're just gonna go through the mill stuff. So um, okay, questions about these squareness perpendicularity. You need to make sure that the grand table. So we just got the cards back for the grand tables, the big ones. Um, we'll put grand tables back on those soon. And um, so you know, wheel a grand table over by you, set your station up so you can do the things you need to do. Go back and forth between the mill and the lay and stuff. Things are in really good positions to do those things. That's why we put those things right there. Um, but really, the outsides of these are all four of them are the same. Um, and if you want, go ahead and solve that material for that. It doesn't make any difference to me. It's ready. Um, I'm going to, um, so I just ordered locks for the saw, uh, for the saw cabinets. I'll let the saw stay open probably this week, and then I'll probably lock up everything after that. That doesn't mean you can't get something solid. But what I want to do is, um, Jacob, if you go through if you saw yourself 25 of these, I, I want to have a conversation before we get to that point, you know, and be like, what is happening? So I'm not saying you can't make more, but I'm saying you're clearly missing a step as we're going. Let's figure out what the step is. Because I know everybody's done it, right? Where you're like, oh my gosh, let's grab another one. Zip over to the saw, saw out another one, try to get it caught over really quick, and then you're like, oh my gosh, let's grab this one too. Slip over there when no one's looking, saw yourself another one, come back over, and next thing you know, you've got a toolbox full of scrap parts or a whole bunch of scrap parts in the in the bin. Somebody comes by and goes, why are there all these scrap indicator arms in here? And you're like, I don't know. That's jacked up, though. And they're all yours, right? So, like, let's just make sure we have a conversation before we get to that point. All right. So, next week, we'll be lockout tag out. Remember, no school, Monday, Labor Day. And um, so no questions on the blocks. So let's go through. I at least want to high point um, these power lines. See how much it lines up. Did you say you took a project out? Yeah, I don't think that you guys say yeah, one, two, three three blocks. You had to saw material for it anyways. One, two, three blocks are super beneficial though. Like I really struggled with it on which one to take out. Um, and I just thought one, two, three blocks, like time-wise, I actually think you could do the, time, the one, two, three blocks faster. But I'd rather do any of the blocks. They're probably more beneficial to you, honestly. You, they probably cost more to buy. They do cost more to buy. You know, and and honestly, man, like I said, I went through, um, like I I toggled back and forth on. Oh, I already thought it was one, two, three blocks for like fifteen bucks. <clears throat> so I've got one, two, three blocks that are fifteen dollar ones, and then yeah, they're fifteen dollars and they're within one point, like one ten. One ten, yeah. And then I have match sets. Those are that's what we took with us to Skills USA. And it's funny because people associate the more expensive tool with being a better piece. So if I were to bring a set of one, two, three blocks in, and I would I would let set two sets down here equal, and I'd be like, I just bought these from MSC for fifteen dollars, and then I've got this set of round sharps that I paid two hundred fifty dollars for. Which one would you take? You always take the two hundred fifty dollar one, like because people are always like people always ask me. How much was that? And, and so I have some brown and sharp ones 
that are match set that come with bolts and the wrenches and everything, you know, and all these all these things for them. And um, so I paid like 200 bucks for a set, and I got two or three sets of them. And then I have three or four sets of $10 ones. They're all exactly the same. There is zero difference between any of them. And uh, but I took those with us just because they're in a case with us to skills USA. And the guys were like, yeah, these are way better. I'm like, they're they're not. They're the exact same thing. There's literally no difference. All right. So, um, okay. We're going to talk about the milling machine. You already know the milling machine. Um, so, just talk about a couple different things on it. Really, what I want to try to get to today is a couple of quick reminders, and we won't go through all the slides on this one. The quill and the auto feed for the quill and reminding us to hit the one shot on the boiler. Who has been oiling their mill as they came up to them? Okay, every day when you come up to the mill, pull that handle up. It is spring loaded. It will then kind of feed out to these metering blocks throughout the mill throughout the day or next couple hours as it probably takes to, to kind of bleed down. Always do that. Always make sure that the table is locked down except for the axis that you're moving. Right? So it's just so easy, man. I mean, I'm telling you, I made a huge mistake. I was telling the group this yesterday. When I was early into my milling career, I was milling this keyway on this plate that was about three feet long, and I did not have the table locked down, and I'm milling through there, and I turned around to get ready for my next operation. I turned back, and that thing had turned the corner. And it just like, like the table started pulling away from it and it just started veering off. And I was like, oh my gosh, stopped it, brought it back. And luckily I wasn't to depth. But then we had to send the customer a part that was supposed to have a big key that went through it that thing something slid on. And then it looked like it had an off ramp on it. You know, it looked like train tracks that had some like diversions on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was so embarrassed. I, mean, I was like 22 years old, you know, and I was like, oh, that's like my first big job to do. And uh, I was like, they are going to unwrap this thing and be like, this looks awesome, except for this. And uh, that was 100% on me. All right, so make sure of those things. And um, let's see, let's see what we can get into. Um, so yeah, there's one shot of locks. If you have problems with locks and stuff, let me know. We'll get those things taken care of. Um, make sure that a couple of, of habits that we, we start to develop. Right. What's that? Yeah, making just just assuming that everything is tight, you know, and just just don't be under that assumption. Also, letting the head get out too far, and finding that things are just kind of starting to do stuff like this, or you notice that your finish is starting to get bad. Sometimes it's because it the head's way too far out. Pull everything back so that it can be as rigid as it can be, right? So when we when we move these over here, we extended out some of the heads, we pulled back some of the heads whatever it took to move them over in a good balanced way. And we were moving them like two or three at a time. So we were just moving them around back and forth and whatever we could get the forks on, picking them up, shooting them over here, dropping them down the floor. So um, a lot of those are not in the places that you necessarily want them to be. All right, quill feed. Everybody will be boring. You two guys are already boring and you're boring holes, okay? So, um, a lot of, or actually all of the mills come with a hand wheel on the front uh, to control the, the quill. So they, if you didn't know, the, the mill auto feeds down in the okay, so to bore a hole. In order to do that, so we take these handles off immediately because somebody will hit their head, poke their eye out, bend or break them. The next thing, so we take those off immediately, the next thing that gets bent or broken is a little knob that goes on the front of the mill. It's right here, G, feed reverse knob. If you'll notice, um, yours is bent, yours is broken. Every one of them is like that. They are either bent or broken. It's almost like you buy a new mill and you just break it immediately because you know it's going to happen. So, I mean, just every mill I've ever worked on has a bolt broke off in it or the bolt is so bent it looks like it's about to break off. That's what you pull in and out to control whether it feeds down or feeds up. 
Did you know uh, that Shifoyo makes like a digital little gauge uh, that you can yeah. set on the... I think everybody does. Um, AccuPro does too. And you can get a digital readout that does X, Y, and Z. I think they even have another one that does X, Y, and Z and then has a fourth one because the knee you can bring up and then the quill you can bring up and down. And if you're super awesome, you've got power of feed in X, Y, and Z. Yeah, uh, all our mills are worth it. Have a beautiful, it's, it's nice. The only thing you have a is one of our Bridgeport doesn't have a URO, and then you know, they don't have that. Yeah. So I always said if I ever had my own mill, yeah. I would have power feed Z, Y, X, have digital readout on everything because nobody else would ever touch it. You know, we have enough digital re or uh, power feeds to do that. Um, we would just need to take the time to do it because when we take power feeds off and replace them, most of the time they're not bad. They just need to be repaired. So we'll just fix them in the off time. And we've got like a dozen of them just sitting around power feeds. And uh, I always think I'm going to do something really cool with them, um, like make something out of them, but I never do. So, um, but they're there. So, uh, when you want to auto feed, you're going to select in or out. You're going to select high or low, um, high, medium, or low for the feed rate. Um, and then um, you're going to pull this lever out, I, and you will auto feed down. You've got this adjuster here that'll auto stop it down at the bottom of the hole. Like these guys are doing their PMI block that has a blind forward hole in it. Here's how I would do that, is I would bring an end mill down to the middle of that hole to depth, and then as I bore it, I would bore it all but about 2,000 deep, so I'd leave about a 2,000 step on there. John had a little bit of chatter at the bottom of his hole yesterday. I would lower my RPM down to where I'm just scraping through there, bring my knee up, Get a good bottom finish on there. Right. Good. Yeah, don't bring a chatter screen. Yeah. I don't want to see a chatter. We are, all of your parts are going to go to 105 Metrology. They're going to be checking them. These parts, the PMI blocks especially, we give out to other departments in the school when they do PMI. And I don't want them to be like, what is this piece of crap? And I'll be like, ah, that came from us. So you want to make your parts look good. Um, okay, high, low, and neutral. You might be running in one of these, or you're probably running in one of these right now if you're on a mill. Um, if you have a problem with it popping out of here, my first go-to, hang through. Because typically what's happening is that shaft's loosened up, so you can hold that thing in there. But don't try to shift it from high to low without loosening the screw back up. There's a little pinch screw in there to keep it from popping out of gear if you're doing some heavy flight diving or something. So just remember, when you do that, when you lock it down, unlock it before you move it to the next position. Um, anybody know offhand what the threads are on an R8 collet or the draw bar? This is worth 10,000, not very much. Would it be fine thread or coarse thread? Coarse. Nope. Not fine. Fine. Lots of gripping power. It was a 50 50. It was a 50 50. Right? Yeah. 16, something more. No. Smaller. Less 16, than a half inch. 16, oh! Warmer. 24. Warm. So 16 is 28. Colder. 7 16 is 19. Ooh. Uh, oh. You just like went right around it. 7 16 is 20. 7 16 is 19 is a common thread option. 7 16 is 20 is what it is. So if you end up getting one where you have you like either seven sixteenths or nines, yeah. If you are messing with your draw bar, running a collet in, and it gives you some problems, don't force it. Take it out, look at the collet, see if the threads are bad. Pull the draw bar out; it's just a bolt. You just pull that bolt out, check the threads on it. We'll run a die nut over it, or we'll run a tap through the bolts. Okay, so. Like, lots of times, and I think that you guys have probably done this, been like, oh, this is really tight. I'm going for it, man. And they just push on through, you know. And I'm like, just now, is your, you guys are better than those guys, right? 
like in the 101s, those guys are just like fumble through the dark. You guys now can take the time and go, hey, this is wrong. I need to fix this before I move on. Because you know it's not going to loosen up. Because that's what you think. Probably some dirt in the threads and it'll probably loosen up. It never loosens up. It gets worse. So go ahead and just fix it as you go. All right. Remember, don't adjust your speed unless it's running. Um, all those other things are pretty straightforward stuff. Okay, so here's some information on um, running the quill feed. There are only three options. Um, I think one is three thousands, four thousands, and six thousands. Yeah. So you got three options. Those are your feed rates. So you can't individualize the feed rates on it. You got three options on it. This yeah, is that's that. This is what's the little thing you got to like push in or out. Yep. Yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, you yours is broken off and yours is bent. So. Um, and then you've got this is how you engage it, disengage it. So pull it out. Um, this little stop right here, as it goes down and hits pressure on it, it'll pop off and release, and then it'll just go back up. Okay. Tramming heads, you may have, you may need, may or may not need to tram your head today. Um, you definitely, if you left your vice on the machine um, and tight, it's definitely not today. You for sure. I actually I think everybody else is, is off as well. Okay. Um, let's take a quick look at this guy. Maybe I want to fight. Well, you didn't lose. I, I listened it though. And I mean, obviously, if you're working on the same mill every day, you're not going to have to worry about those things. But since we are in the, we're in a learning process rather than a production process. We need to just make sure. That I've we're... seen like uh, edge tech technology make some weird looking deal that it kind of indicates both sides of your bias. Like what? But it's, uh, oh, so like you said that there's got two indicators yeah. on there or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so fast. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know if, if you spend more than five minutes squaring your device up, same thing with indicating a part in. Like, in the beginning, indicating a part in or squaring a device was really hard for you. You guys were like trying to figure out how to do any way to not do it. It should become second nature for you to do. I mean, I walk up to a, a manual mill, CNC mill, I assume that the device is not square. I immediately go grab my indicator, check it, and um, and just take off. You know, I just assume that it's not right. Okay, talking about some special cutters. We've gotten into a habit of notice where everybody kind of goes, hey, just give me a half inch in them. And just a half inch in is not the thing for everything, okay? Make sure that you're paying attention this semester especially. Um, if you're in steel and you have massive amounts of material to remove, you need to use roughing in them. If you're in steel, you need to use a pork fluid in them. If you're in aluminum, you need to use a two fluid in them. Unless it's a three quarter in mill or bigger, then it's a three fluid in mill. Okay. Remember, calculate your speed and feeds. When you're in aluminum, rock on through that thing. When you're in steel, most of our steel is mild steel, but with tool steel, it's going to be a little bit different. So why two fluid on aluminum? So that's a so it's a good question. So in in aluminum, uh, uh, since that aluminum is so much gummier. Uh, you want that high helix. You want you should you can push through faster. And so it only having two flutes, having four flutes only leaves you a quarter for all that chip to develop in there. Having two flutes leaves you 180 degrees for that chip to develop and evacuate up out of there. So like when we use like the core fives, those are five flute mLs, but they feed so much faster. Right, so they're three and four hundred inches a minute as we're going through there with that, but you're not doing that on the manual mills. So different scenario there. If you were using coolant or an air blast or something like that, it would be slightly different. So some different form tools. Pay attention to those things. This is the R8 taper. Got your undercut in the middle. Um, I hope to get in mills ordered. 
four year old toolboxes within the next week or two. Um, have you ever used a right angle head? Yeah, you know what happens with almost every right angle head that I've ever seen? Oh, you're talking about aluminum now? Yeah. Um, almost every right angle head I've ever seen has been broken. Really? Yeah, I've just seen them. I've never. They are super, so they're Why super they're delicate. Oh, it, I mean, if you if you need one, it's the best thing in the world. Um, if you have a big part that you need to put a side hole in, um, you've got this right angle adapter that goes on the quill, bolts onto the quill, so you call it, and uh, it'll then your end mill will go out this way. And I mean, it's just literally right angle on there. And uh, um, it's awesome if you need it and you've got a position for it. Uh, they make them for the CNC as well. So it's a whole right angle tool holder. Goes into your yeah, you I've know. seen ones for the CNC that like you can even adjust the angles mm -hmm. to. Yeah, which is awesome. I mean, if you need a side hole or a slot mill on the side and you only have a three-axis machine, great, it's a great thing. When you clamp this up down, either toe clamps or um, uh, strap clamps, you want to make sure that you are level or slightly this way towards the workpiece, not the other way, or you're just getting the backside of the pinch on. Fixturing. Um, you guys are all familiar with that. I feel like I only want to use those toe clamps for wood. <laughs> oh, you know, I don't know. Mighty Bike, some of those places, they make some really good ones. Um, the great thing about them is you can clamp it down the table and not stem to mill all the way across the table. Like, you don't have to worry, you can mill all the way across the surface of it. That's pretty slick. I think this one had something I wanted to see. Oh, yeah, I know what it was. Just one thing that I wanted to talk about. Make sure you're trimming your head every day. And I think it's towards the end. There is a speed of feed calculation. Um, also, there is going to be one. And that's straight out of the book. We've got several of them out there for you to use. So when I was tramming like our guys at work, mm -hmm. the, the guy I work with, he said that so our bias is like perpendicular to the thing, so he told me to just do it off the table. You mean hold up say tell me to say he that. said that the bias isn't perpendicular to the spindle. Oh, okay. So that the vice jaws are kind of like this or something? I think so. Okay. What you ought to do is fix it. Um, especially if that back jaw, that rigid jaw can come off. If you got the time, just take it off, grind it up, and then be good to go. That way you don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't so have, I also have noticed like sometimes I'll clamp something and if I clamp it too tight, so push it up. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty common. If you've got a, a rigid vice jaw that's sitting like this. See how it kind of creates that ramp that pushes it up? Um, if anything, you want it to go like this, that pulls it down, right? Yeah. So, I mean, ideally, perpendicularity would be the thing that we would have, that we would have a flat bottom on our vice. That back rigid jaw would be nice and straight. Here's a little bit on mooring. You can take a look at that, help you get a little caught up as we go through mooring. Feed direction is what I want to talk about, though. Um, when you are milling, around the outside of something. Are you climb cutting or conventional cutting on the manual machine? Conventional. Conventional milling. So that means that the cutter is on the right hand side of the part all the time. So that means like taking I'm, heavy cuts are going that way? I'm going around this way yeah. on the part. Okay, because my cutter, looking down at my cutter, so if I'm riding on top of the cutter like a riding lawnmower, my, I'm on the right hand side of it. So I look to the left and I see my part, okay? And then like heavy cuts when you're going back and forth. Yeah, well, feeding. you're always spinning the same yeah, way. Always. But so on the mill, you always want to 
the only time that I will reverse that is not necessarily in heavy cuts, but if I've got something that's like flame cut and it's really jagged, then I will go the other direction on it. I might climb cut that way. You can climb cut because it creates a better finish yeah. on finished passes, taking very small amounts. If you try to climb cut, taking a 10, 20, 50 thousand cut, I'm not so concerned about that. But what it will do, and the only way that that's going to happen is if you don't have right speed to feed, because we climb cut all the time on CCs. But if your table's not locked down, that table will either take off from you or run itself towards you, right? Like if you ever had not had the table tight and you're milling something, you go, Burr! I mean, it's because you're going the wrong way. And so you want to make sure that you're climb cutting in everything. I'm okay with conventional cutting for minute, small finish passes, just because it does improve the surface finish. finish. What's that? You said conventional. What's that? You said conventional for small stuff. Oh, sorry. Climb cutting for small amounts. Conventional cutting, 99% of the time, you should be conventional cutting for everything on the right-hand side. Um, our, our, the cutter always spins the same way. Um, Make sure that you're not too far out of the vise, especially if you're taking heavy cuts. You want to retain that thing in there as grippy as you can, right? So that you can get good, um, good impact on that. Okay. Uh, so those are kind of the things that I'm looking for for you guys. Whenever I walk past you guys, I'm looking at how you got your part set up. Um, I mean, if you've got a part clamped, let's just say your part. If you clamped it down to the table and squared it up, I would be like, Jake, what are you doing? I just square up my parallel. Just yeah. Freaking bends out of crap. Yeah, I mean that's what happens. Everybody from 101s have been drilling into them, milling them, using them as pry bars, diving boards, throwing stars, and everything. So we were actually going to take all of them this summer, clamp them all together, and grind them top and bottom. But we didn't even have air until right before school started. So. We basically ran the entire shop off of a little portable air compressor that we just drug around with us throughout the entire place. We don't even have our right air compressor right now. So I think our air compressor is supposed to be here over the next month or so. Um, side milling, that's the wrong side milling. Um, make sure that you're thinking about it. I mean, if you're going to try and side mill six inches deep, that's a no go. You know, and also, if you're going to take a half inch end mill and try to go down two inches with it, it's not going to work right. That'd be an extended end. Well, yeah, not only do we have deflection on the side, but that's, that's on average, you only get um, one and a half times the diameter for the length of cut. So it's a half inch end mill. You really only get about three quarters of the length of side cutting on it. So if you need to mill down two inches deep, you're going to need to have like an inch and a half end mill to be able to mill down two inches deep. You can buy four by twos or whatever it might happen to be, so it, it's longer end mills as it goes. But um, something, if it's, if it's a very big cut, rotate it over, indicate it. I need to do that on parts yeah. that I can't rotate all the time with the work on the home Bible. <laughs> right. The, the longer end mills have their own, they bring their own problems in, anyways. You know, so you want to. You want to watch those. Um, let's see. More about cutting directions. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and go back to modules. We are in module two this week. This is what is here. Uh, again, I don't care how you do projects, you can do it in whatever direction that you are. You guys do a great job of just mixing them up um, on this one. That's the one that you need to be paying attention to. That's the one that you need to be thinking about. Go ahead and get that thing sawed up. Those things sawed up today. Saw yourself one extra. Um, you group saw those together. Um, get them out of the way. Those, that material is not in the um, cabinet. I'll, I'll get that material out. And then I want you to saw it down to 32 inch long pieces so we can get it in the cabinet today. And um, you saw the sign vice conservative. I don't think so. Jacob definitely did because he's yeah. working on his. If you need to get sawing done today, get sawing done today. Okay. Because next week, as soon as my locks come in, I'm going to lock those cabinets down. 
and then you are going to need to give me um, an essay on why you need an extra piece of material, 50 push-ups, and paint a wall. I'm just kidding. But I will want to know why you need more material. All I need is an explanation. Scrap this part because I wasn't paying attention. I thought I didn't realize it was a half-inch tap hole. So it was a tap-inch hole, drilled through it, then I realized it needed to be tapped. I just need an explanation. What happened? Okay. All right, questions? Okay. Um, this 10 to 1 today, bring me back three unique items from places that you go to. This is 1022 Saturday. Um, bring yourself and a friend, and um, that's a, a ticketed drawing item as well. So, you have to the food? You the video. I'm so hungry right now. Dude, there's free lunch today. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Hey. I have no idea. It's probably very good. I had to tell the other class, no food talk. So, <laughs> I'm not really telling you guys no food talk. I'm just saying. He's so good though.